I've discussed in previous video videos information on supplements and other methods to raise levels of nitric oxide, also known as NO. As many people are aware, nitric oxide is basically ty a type of uh, it's a type of free radical. It's a gas, but in relation to bodybuilding and fitness, uh, it's generally favored because it has a dilation action in the on the blood vessels. It, or it basically opens up blood vessels, which in turn increases oxygen and nutrient delivery to muscles, and also increases mu the much sought after muscle pump. Uh, there's been various supplements that are touted to increase nitric oxide. The foremost one being, of course, arginine. Arginine is a conditionally essential amino acid, meaning that it's not considered an essential amino acid because it could be synthesized in the body, but under some conditions, such as high stress conditions, uh, or for example, after surgery or during injuries, the body cannot produce enough arginine. And in that sense, it becomes what they call conditionally essential. Uh, but I, I don't really I want to talk that much about arginine, but I'll, I'll go a brief overview of some of the uh, substances that are known to increase nitric oxide besides arginine. Uh, as I said in past videos, the main problem with arginine is that it's difficult to absorb orally. The studies that show that arginine increased nitric oxide almost always involved an intravenous uh, uh, design. In other words, they provided uh, uh, arginine in, in high doses uh, of anywhere from 18 to 30 grams. And when you provide uh, arginine in, uh, to that extent intravenously, it bypasses all the notable gastrointestinal barriers that affect oral arginine supplementation. So uh, you get a huge increase in uh, nitric oxide when it's provided uh, when arginine is provided intravenously. Now, what happens when you take it orally? is that only 60% of any oral dose of arginine is actually absorbed. Why does that happen? There's a couple of barriers in the gastrointestinal area, notably an enzyme called arginase. Arginase is the main uh, enzyme that degrades arginine. Uh, it breaks it down before it can be converted into any kind of nitric oxide, before it can be done for anything else. Now, you might say, well, if only 60% of an oral dose of uh, arginine is broken down, doesn't that mean the other 40% will be converted into nitric oxide? The answer to that is yes and no. It depends on the person. Now, 40% of the average dose of arginine doesn't leave much arginine, so you're not going to get a uh, massive conversion into nitric oxide. And also, you have to consider individual pr uh, problems with that. For example, some people, uh, uh, they might have damage to the lining of the, uh, of the uh, arteries, uh, also called the endothelium. Now, this is where the enzyme that converts uh, arginine into nitric oxide is produced. It's called nitric oxide synthase. synthase. And if you have damage to your endothelium, or again, lining of the arteries, uh, you're, you won't be able to produce enough of this enzyme. So no matter how much arginine you take, you're not going to uh, get any, any, uh, any significant uh, nitric oxide synthesis. And there's another problem in that in older people, you, uh, you get a, a tendency for the nitri uh, for the uh, ingested arginine to be converted into a uh, substance called asymmetric dimethyl arginine. This is basically a, biz <laughs> a bizarre form of arginine that really has no biological activity and cannot be converted into nitric oxide. In fact, there's a theory among some physiologists that it's the buildup of asymmetric dimethyl arginine uh, which can't be converted into NO, uh, this, uh, they think this might be one of the root causes of what's known as essential hypertension or high blood pressure where they don't really know the root cause because without nitric oxide, the blood vessels cannot dilate properly and you can get hypertension or high blood pressure. And also without nitric oxide, the blood vessels tend to get very stiff. They lose their suppleness. And this stiffness of arteries is a direct precursor of atherosclerosis, which uh, again is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease, heart disease, strokes, that type of thing. Now, uh, the, again, there's ways around the arginine problem, as I mentioned in previous videos. One way, a really good way, is to ingest beet juice. Uh, this would be about six to eight ounces of beet juice. You have to ingest that at least two and a half hours before training because uh, what happens is the beet juice contains nitrates, natural nitrates. The nitrates are, are con first converted by enzymes 
uh, found in certain bacteria that exist in the mouth. So they start the conversion of nitrates into nitrites. But then as you swallow the beet juice in the gut, another group of enzymes converts what is now nitrites into nitric oxide. The problem is, however, that this takes about at least two and a half hours because these enzymes need time to work. So if you were to just down a glass of beet juice right before you work out, you're not going to get any benefit. Now, what benefit would you get from the beet juice? Well, some studies show an, uh, uh, a possible, because of the nitric oxide increase that results from drinking beet juice, you get uh, increased oxygen and nutrient delivery to muscle, you get greater pump, but more importantly and most significantly, uh, the studies show you get about a 23% increase in training intensity. Now, that increase in training intensity translates into greater muscle growth because you can train harder with less fatigue. So in that sense, nitric oxide is a, is a uh, indirect anabolic substance, not to mention the fact that nitric oxide is also involved in the release of growth hormone, insulin, and testosterone, all of which can be anabolic in the body, especially testosterone and growth hormone. Insulin is more anti-catabolic than anabolic unless it's in the presence of a large amount of amino acids, but that's a, a whole different subject I'm not going to get into. Another way uh, of increasing nitric oxide without ingesting arginine is to ingest a non uh, a non protein uh, well they call it non protein amino acid citrulline because citrulline is not incorporated into tissues as are essential amino acids and other amino acids so it's called a non protein amino acid citrulline is found in watermelon uh, and other uh, sub uh, sources citrulline what happens when you ingest citrulline is it, it, it travels to the kidneys where enzymes convert it into arginine. Uh, by doing so, it bypasses the notable arginase, arginase barrier that, that, that breaks down arginine. So the citrulline kind of goes around that barrier, gets to the kidneys, and enzymes in the kidneys convert it back into arginine. The arginine then is released into the blood, and as soon as it run, run in, runs into that nitric oxide converting enzyme in the, uh, in the blood vessel, it's converted right into nitric oxide very fast. So citrulline and a dose of about six to eight grams, about an hour, about an hour before. Again, you got to give it some time. You want to ingest citrulline about an hour before training. So those are two possible ways. Now, there's a, uh, this is the main subject I'm, I'm going to talk about in this video. Uh, those of you who use uh, a lot of pre-workout supplements or have tried them, you might have noticed a particular ingredient in the supplements called L-norvaline. L-norvaline is a isomer or a for, or a basically different form of one of the branch chain amino acids called valine. There's three branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Now the problem with norvaline is, uh, is that just like asymmetric dimethyl arginine can take the place of arginine and it, because it doesn't act like arginine, it doesn't produce any biological effects including nitric oxide production. Well, norva, norvaline can also take the place of valine, and in doing so, it provides no biological activity. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, the, a, a new study that was published in, a, let me see the name of this journal, was called, uh, it's called Toxicology in Vitro, Toxicology in Vitro. Uh, the study is uh, called Cytotoxicity and Mitochondrial Dysfunction Caused by the Dietary Supplement and Norvaline. Uh, this was a group at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. What they did is they did an in vitro study. An in vitro study is isolated uh, is a study of isolated cells outside the body, or basically test tube study. Uh, I normally don't write about uh, in vitro studies in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. I don't even like to talk about them in, in videos because in vitro studies are very preliminary. In other words, what happens in a test tube? doesn't necessarily happen in the human body. A good example of this, as I mentioned in a previous video, uh, they discovered a substance a couple of years ago, a type of seaweed, where in a test tube, it locks onto the protein myostatin and it completely inhibits it. Myostatin is a protein produced in muscle that prevents muscle growth. So based on this test tube study, they started selling supplements of this seaweed, but in the human body, unfortunately, it didn't mimic what it did in the test tube. So it didn't, it didn't affect myostatin at all. It, had, it was useless. So that's why you got to be very careful of in vitro studies. However, this particular study, uh, it, it made a lot of sense, and uh, it did use 
isolated mammalian cells, human cells. And what the study found was that uh, providing certain dose of, of valine actually caused a, a, a breakdown of uh, damaged brain cells. And this is curious because a, a mouse study, which was published in 2018, showed when they gave norvaline to mice, it actually had a preventive effect against Alzheimer's disease. What it did, providing norvaline to the mice, prevented the buildup of beta amyloid, beta amyloid, which is a toxic protein or could be toxic uh, when produced in large amounts in the brain. That's considered one of the causes of Alzheimer's disease. And, it, and this is very curious that this newest study found that norvaline, instead of uh, instead of uh, let's say nourishing brain cells, actually destroyed them. And the mechanism, it turns out, they think was uh, because of damage to mitochondria. Mitochondria are are they're kind of like the powerhouses of the cell. They're little cigar-shaped organelles, and that exist in cells. They function to produce energy as ATP, and also. They also uh, uh, are, are the site of fat uh, oxidation, a process called beta oxidation, which is a whole different subject. I've covered that in my Applied Metabolics newsletter. I'm not going to get into it now, but the thing that you have to know is that uh, when, they, uh, when they expose these isolated cells, human cells, to norvaline, it caused destruction. Now, what, it, what happens is that you know because, uh, because norvaline cannot be used like valine, uh, when 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 it's if it's used and uh, if it's too much is supplied, it can displace valine, and this results in a in a situation called protein misfolding. Protein misfolding. I, I don't want to get into a big explanation of that, but basically, it, it's a, it's a root cause of many diseases, especially brain degeneration. It's involved in Alzheimer's disease. In other words, the problem with norvaline is that it, it has no biological activity, really, and it can displace amino acids uh, such as the branched chain amino acids, which do have biological activity. Now, an interesting fact about norvaline is that if you ingest it with branched chain amino acids, the, uh, the, the mere presence of the other branched chain of amino acids actually prevents the toxic effects of norvaline. This probably explains why people who have used pre-workout supplements that contain norvaline have not noticed any probably side effects. The average dose of norvaline used in supplements is about 400 milligrams. Why would they incorporate norvaline? Because norvaline is a very effective inhibitor of arginine, arginase. And again, that's the enzyme that breaks down arginine. So theoretically, if let's say you uh, you had a supplement that contained arginine and you also included norvaline, the norvaline would inhibit the arginase, arginase, which normally would degrade arginine. Therefore, it would allow a greater amount of arginine to be converted into nitric oxide. And indeed, some studies have shown that you, when you provide norvaline with arginine, you get about a 55% greater increase in nitric oxide. Uh, so, but but again, you know, the problem here is that norvaline is a direct toxic uh, substance. Uh, I, I mean, again, if you take it with branched chain amino acids, th there's probably no real problem there because the branched chain amino acids, you know, will displace the norvaline and, and basically inhibit any, any toxicities. But, you know, taking norvaline now, some of you might be tempted to, and they do sell it alone. They sell standalone norvaline supplements. This would be a mistake because without the presence of the branched chain amino acids, norvaline is toxic to cells. It's, uh, even though, again, this is an in vitro study, it's a pretty solid study. And, and I would say that based on, on the results of this study, I'm just kind of leaving through it now, uh, it would indicate that uh, norvaline by itself is without question toxic. And again, the, uh, the main... Uh, the main mechanism seems to be an increase in what they call protein misfolding and also direct damage to the mitochondria of cells, which is very serious because mitochondrial uh, decay or destruction is, is, a, uh, is a cornerstone of many, many diseases, including brain degeneration. Uh, Alzheimer's is involved in Alzheimer's. It's also involved in the aging process. As the cells lose mitochondria, the source of energy for cells, mainly uh, ATP, 
it gets lower and without ATP the cells can't replicate and they die a process called apoptosis and on a large scale this is what aging is and your muscles are particularly uh, susceptible to mitochondrial loss because as the mitochondria as you lose mitochondria with age muscles age and you know this causes a lot of the muscle atrophy that's associated with age uh, the good news is that you can uh, you can actually boost mitochondria just by working that alone uh, it stimulates a, a substance called B PGC1A which actually actually stimulates mitochondria synth synthesis again hold another subject I don't want to get into that but the important point here that that you want to know is that norvaline uh, by itself is actually a uh, is actually a toxic amino acid uh, so you know the question arises uh, somebody might say well I'm taking a pre-workout supplement and I notice that it contains norvaline, it contains 400 milligrams, that's the average dose included in the supplements. Should I toss the supplements? The answer to that is very simple. If the supplement also includes branched chain amino acids, then you're, you're, you're okay, you're covered, because the branched chain amino acids will prevent the toxicity of, of ingesting isolated norvaline. And because of the presence of the branched chain amino acids, the norvaline might actually inhibit arginine, which uh, which would actually increase nitric oxide considerably. So again, the, the take-home lesson of this video is if you're ingesting norvaline in a, let's say, a pre-workout formula that also contains branched-chain amino acids, you're okay. Don't worry about it. And you again, you want to have a lot more of the branched-chain amino acids than you have a norvaline. For example, if the supplement contains 400 milligrams of norvaline, and only contains 100 milligrams of uh, the B, of the uh, branched chain amino acids. Not good, not good. You have to have the branched chain amino acids have to be in greater quantity than the norvaline to offer a protective effect against the toxic possible side effects of ingesting isolated nor norvaline. So, so that's the uh, take home message. Again, don't use isolated norvaline supplements. They are cell toxic, especially to brain cells. Don't use them. And that's about it for this video. Uh, if you want further information about nutrition, exercise science, hormonal therapy, anti-aging research, fat loss techniques that really work, women's health and fitness, uh, hormonal therapy, uh, exercise science, subscribe today to my Applied Metabolics newsletter, www.appliedmetabolics.com. It's 40 to 50 pages every month, solid, evidence-based information, no BS, no ads. I'm not trying to sell you anything except information. It's based on my 57 years of constant study and practical experience in the gym. I know it works, and I know it doesn't work, and I'm going to tell you everything in this newsletter. Uh, so subscribe today again, www.appliedmetabolics.com. Uh, if you subscribe, I'll, I'll send you an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook page where every day I post new information on nutrition, exercise science, and general health and medicine. Uh, I also will answer uh, short questions submitted to me by subscribers at the email portal located on my Applied Metabolics website. Uh, I generally don't respond to questions from people that aren't subscribers. You're welcome to leave uh, comments under the videos. I may or may not answer them. Uh, you know, it's an iffy proposition. However, I always answer questions submitted to me by subscribers. If you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, go to your local shelter, adopt a dog. They are fantastic. Take care. Thanks for listening.